no, no. And then there's a lot of histamine release too in response to casein ingestion in certain folks that may explain some of the inflammation that you're seeing. Um, you know, so, so there are other problems with it, but the, like I said, a, you know, ferment, fermented dairy is the lesser of the evils there. Yeah. Andy D's thoughts or you in shock I'm not even going to add anything because uh, that is the <laughs> longest answer to a question we've ever had. And I thought it was excellent, but uh, you know, we got to keep the train moving. That may be the show. That's almost <laughs> the show. <laughs> That's the show. This is no, be there's a like... 15 part uh, a Matt Lalon <laughs> piece here. Yeah. Matt will be like 52, and we'll still be working on this. <laughs> All right, so we move on. We got uh, a question from our friend Ben. says, Matt, been looking forward to seeing you on the show for some time. A few questions from a fellow Canadian. So number one, could you please explain the difference between physiological insulin resistance and pathological insulin resistance? I think this is something that gets very mixed up, not only in the mainstream, but also in the low-carb paleo community. Yeah, this is a goodie. Yeah, uh, Ben uh, must be a CF or who uh, who likes to rain down the pain or have pain rain down on him because this is going to be painful. So uh, <laughs> we might lose some listeners there, and some of you might fall asleep. But yeah, I'll I'll, I'll address this. Um, so here here's a question: Would a low carbohydrate, high fat diet induce insulin resistance in a human being? Yes, yes, it would. Is it pathogenic? No, it's not. And uh, I'll try to uh, get that point across. A good paper to look at is one called the effect of short-term starvation versus high-fat diet on intramyocellular triglyceride accumulation and insulin resistance in physically fit men. It was uh, published in Ex Physiol 2006, volume 91, number 4, page 693 to 703. The study compared the effect of short-term starvation and a high-fat diet on insulin resistance and the accumulation of IMTGs. They're also known as intramuscular triglycerides, not just intramyocellular triglycerides. So it turns out that both diets had similar effects, and on, the only common denominator was carbohydrate scarcity. So they starve people, they put people on a high-fat diet, and they measure the level of insulin resistance, and they're the same, lo and behold. So what's going on here? Well, the authors in the paper discuss this at length, and they're like, you know, this has to be a normal physiological adaptation to, har to carbohydrate restriction. So why would, would the body do that? Well, it turns out that, I mean, there's a lot of misconceptions here. Uh, but the brain does need carbohydrate. It doesn't only consume carbohydrate. That's not true. But it does need carbohydrate. The brain can survive on a mixture that is as low as 25% glucose and about 75% ketone bodies. So when ketones in short supply, the body's going to turn on insulin resistance in the muscles to make sure that they don't take up any of the carbohydrate, any of the glucose, and to make sure that the, the brain gets all of it. Um, so it's just to spare glucose for the brain. The muscles are going to then accumulate lipid stores in a similar way to what they do when glucose is around and they store glycogen. It's just this time they're accumulating lipids, so you're going to see intramyocellular triglycerides. What's interesting is that you also see IMTGs and insulin resistance in type 2 diabetes, but it's in a different context, and I'll get to that a little later. So insulin resistance alone does not define type 2 diabetes, right? Insulin resistance in type 2 diabetes is accompanied by hyperglycemia, by hyperinsulinemia, and then a host of other, uh, other factors. So the insulin resistance that results from a low-carbohydrate or ketogenic diet, it's merely intended to spare glucose for the brain. It is not pathogenic. Unfortunately, and Rob has covered this in a previous podcast, if you do test these people with a glucose tolerance test, they will fail, not just because their muscles are insulin resistance, resistant to uh, spare glucose for the brain, but also because pancreatic glucokinase has been uh, downregulated because it's not needed as much, and pancreatic glucokinase senses glucose in portal blood. So their ability to sense glucose is downregulated. Their muscles are insulin resistant. You give those people uh, a glucose tolerance test, their blood glucose is going to skyrocket and it's going to stay there for a long time. And it's, it's, it's a really irresponsible practice, in my opinion. It, it has to stop. Like, you should not do that to people. So insulin in itself is not necessarily pathogenic. It has to be put into context. Um, you know, individuals on a low-carbohydrate carb diet, uh, like I said, are going to fail this glucose tolerance test. But what uh, most people don't know is that insulin resistance can actually save your life. 
So it's been observed that the tissues of injured individuals who lose large quantities of blood quickly become insulin resistant. And again, this is a survival strategy. It's to spare glucose for the, for the brain. So insulin resistance can actually improve your chances of survival. This is a very well known and studied physiological adaptation. Um, interestingly, there's a lot of, of rat studies showing that high fat feeding promotes syndrome X but there's um, plenty of misconceptions and deceitfulness and dishonesty going on in these studies. So the researchers will never discuss the results of the studies in the context that I have just discussed, saying that, hey, this is actually just a normal adaptation. Um, but there's also other things going on in the diets that are being fed to the rodents. If you actually look them up, and you can anybody can, can download these diets, if you just type in the name in Google, the PDFs will come up. But the, the diets are not real food, for one. If you look at what they feed these animals, it's a sacrilege. It's just horrible. And then we wonder why they die and get sick. But anyways, a lot of the diets are deficient in omega-3 fatty acids. And it has been shown that you can put a rodent on a high-fat diet and then add the omega-3 fatty acid back in, and you will normalize insulin resistance. And I've got uh, two papers for, for to show this fish oil prevents insulin resistance induced by high fat feeding in rats that was published in Science in 1987, volume 237, page 885 to 888. And then there's influence of dietary fat composition on development of insulin resistance in rats, relationship to muscle triglycerides and omega-3 fatty acids in muscle and phospholipid that was published in Diabetes in 1991, volume 40, page 280. What's interesting to note when you look at those papers and that EPA and DHA are far more effective than alpha linoleic, linolenic acid. So the long chain omega-3 fatty acids are more effective at normalizing insulin resistance within the context of a high fat diet for rodents. The only vegetarian source of DHA you should keep in mind is algae. So if you're a vegetarian and you want to get some good uh, omega-3, get yourself some algal DHA. It's available from CVS. Uh, and it'll help you a lot. What's interesting is that DHA can be um, retro-converted into EPA much more effectively, actually, than EPA can be retro-converted in DHA. And that's because in biology, uh, getting from point A to point B is not always the same pathway as getting from point B to point A. So if you want some information on that, you can look at uh, physio physiological compartmental analysis of alpha linoleic acid metabolism in adult humans. That was in the Journal of Lipid Research in 2001. Uh, volume 42, page 1257. In there, you'll find the fact that uh, EPA is poorly converted to DHA. If you want to find uh, the retro conversion, you can look up dietary docosahexaenoic acid as a source of eicosapentaenoic acid in vegetarians and omnivores. That was published in Lipids in 1997, volume 32, page 342. So diets that are employed in high-fat feeding studies of rodents are also rich in a synthetic trans fatty acid called elatic acid, if they are using a hydrogenated fat, elatic acid is a synthetic trans fatty acid that is created upon the hydrogenation of vegetable oils. And it has been shown that human subjects consuming 20% of their energy intake as trans fatty acids have been shown uh, to develop uh, insulin resistance. And if you want a paper on that, you can look up intake of a high diet in trans monounsaturated fatty acids or saturated fatty acids, effects on postprandial insulinemia and glycemia in obese patients with NIDDM. That was published in Diabetes Care in 1997, uh, volume 20, page 881. So again, a lot of the, the studies that you will find on this are flawed. They're not putting the, re the results into context. Um, and I think that, uh, I mean, it would be interesting to discuss this, uh, to compare this, for example, with the insulin resistance that is created from excess consumption of carbohydrates, specifically fructose. Um, so fructose can be metabolized by the kidneys, uh, adipocytes, or their fat cells, and hepatocytes that are liver cells, but the liver deals with approximately 50 to 75% of the load. So when fructose and glucose enter cells, in order to stay in the cells, they have to be phosphorylated by ATP-dependent enzymes, and that phosphorylation prevents the glucose and the fructose from leaving the cell. Uh, in hepatocytes, which are liver cells, the glucokinase takes care of that job, whereas fructokinase takes care of the job for fructose. But downstream metabolites regulate the activity of glucokinase, but they prevent uh, excessive phosphorylation of glucose. That doesn't happen for fructokinase. It's poorly regulated, and you can, your liver can just phosphorylate a ton of fructose. 
What's interesting is that fructose increases the activity of glucokinase, which means that your liver gets turned into a sugar sponge when you have a lot of fructose around. And a large bolus of fructose and glucose is going to rapidly fill liver glycogen stores. That means that all the remaining carbohydrates going to be fed to the Krebs cycle. Citric acid or citrate is going to overflow out of the Krebs cycle. That's going to be fed into a pathway called de novo lipogenesis, which literally means new fat creation. And de novo lipogenesis is going to turn that carbohydrate into a saturated fatty acid called palmitic acid. So what's interesting is that aside from glucose scarcity, another signal that turns on insulin resistance is the presence of a lot of fatty acids. You know, if you're eating a lot of fat and not eating a lot of carbohydrate, those are two good signals that uh, insulin resistance in the muscles should be turned on. But now here you are creating a lot of a fatty acid called palmitic acid, which actually makes its way to the brain and gives the signal to turn on insulin resistance. And this has been known, and I can provide some, re some references for that. Uh, but you're doing this in the context of, or this is happening in the context of a high carbohydrate diet. Now you're in trouble because insulin resistance gets turned on when there's still a lot of glucose flowing in the bloodstream. So the, that's going to cause hyperglycemia, which is observed in type 2 diabetes. That's then going to result into hyperinsulinemia because that glucose has to go somewhere. So insulin is going to be released to try to shove it into cells. Uh, if the glucose stays around for too long, you're going to form advanced glycation end products. And then you're going to get some more detrimental health outcomes from the fact that insulin is high all the time. So I hope that, you know, that explanation gives you a pretty good idea of why insulin resistance within the context of a high fat diet and insulin resistance within the context of a high carbohydrate diet are uh, different and one is not pathogenic whereas the other one is pathogenic. I, I think I'm going to cut it here. Um, I do want to address one thing because I get a lot of questions for this and, and this individual and this book in particular has really, really irked me. Um, I'm, I'm going to criticize Tim Ferriss, who has been on, on Rob's uh, blog uh, before. Um, so <laughs> Tim, Tim describes experiments in his book where he's cheating on his diet with carbohydrate-rich foods, but he's not seeing his blood sugar rise to pathological levels, and uh, he's measuring his blood sugar with a nifty little machine, and uh, he's you know saying that his protocol works and that his supplements and his, his stupid little air squats, you know, turning on non-insulin-mediated glucose uptake actually are helping. But there's, there's really two things going on here, I think. Tim's insulin sensitivity and insulin secretion are still good. So his body's doing a good job of shoving the glucose into cells. That's what he's observing. That's why his blood sugars are not going to pathological levels above 160 mg per deciliter. Um, and the fructose that's in the meal that he's eating is causing the liver to absorb glucose from the bloodstream. So that leads to lower blood sugar levels, okay, but that means that his liver's taking a, a huge hit and this is bad because the liver is actually one of the few organs that can release blood sugar in, back into the bloodstream, which means that it's involved in blood sugar control. And that's not, and, you know, liver dysfunction is not desirable. There's a variety, you know, what Tim is not measuring is insulin levels. And I bet that if you were to look at his insulin levels, they would surpass the level um, or the, like the, the threshold that then causes a variety of metabolic shifts and problems, including the dysregulation of uh, appetite. So I just, I could not disagree with him more on, on this whole little protocol. And I can tell you right now that if a type 2 diabetic were to implement that, it would ruin them. Because by definition, type 2 diabetes, you get that, you reach that point, once you no longer produce enough insulin for your level of insulin resistance. So you can imagine what would be going on here with a, with a type 2 diabetic. And this is part of why we're real reticent in general to recommend the, uh, the real crazy bender uh, cheat days. Yeah, it, it, We had a talk, a, a, a question about that in the, the last podcast, and I, I've just never seen good outcomes on that. And then uh, Matt and I have talked about this too. We've not seen the type of benefits out of a cyclic low carb diets that that you would kind of like to see mm -hmm. and this is where I gotten to more of uh, uh trying to get some carbs in uh, you know maybe post workout on a daily basis yep. because getting that that consistent adaptation of using the amount of carbs that you need to for uh, the day-to-day -day specific activities but also upregulating the uh the the 
insulin sensitivity that is of benefit and and not sliding you into that that uh insulin resistance that's merely an outgrowth of a, a high fat diet but then if you need that for uh you know carbohydrate for activity or or a, a you know, muscle glycogen stores, then it's going to be difficult to just get that in into the, the muscle because of yeah. the insulin resistance. Matt, it, it's also probably worth pointing out to folks when people hear, say, a commentary about, uh, you know, high, uh, high fat, low carb diets are, are dangerous. There's a nice response to that, uh, which is you can ask the individual, is therapeutic fasting beneficial? Yeah. And, and if the person says yes, then it's obvious they don't know what the hell they're talking about because the two states are metabolically identical. Yeah, they're very similar. Yeah, yeah. And um, I think Andy Dees has left. I I, I've got, like, you know, this reminds me of one thing. The whole concept of the glycemic load, I don't disagree with it entirely, but the problem is that if a food contains fructose, it you know, a lot of sugar is going to get shoved into the liver. So it's going to have a glycemic load that appears that the you know that's lower and makes the food appear a little better. Um, so that you know the glycemic load's not the end all be all. You really need to consider the amount of fructose that's in the food too. I did not leave the building. <laughs> I thought that Andy had committed some sort of a, a <laughs> tea induced suicide. <laughs> I overdosed on decaf tea and it took me out. It was the end of my day. Awesome. <laughs> Are we ready to move on to the next part of Matt's, uh, Ben's questions? Cod liver. Cod liver. Yes. Weston A. Price says yes. Cordain says no. Uh, why do the well, who do the lay people believe? Both have good, very good research on both sides. Could it be the problem lies with cod liver oils that have been stripped of natural A and D and replaced with the synthetic variety? Go. So it is true that over time the amount of vitamin D in cod liver oil has changed. That's an effect. Uh, but I will say that. You know, Rob and I have looked at this research extensively. I am personally not satisfied with the quality of the research that is out there, and I feel that it is insufficient to come up with a conclusion on this. I, um, I did a, a piece on this, which was basically kind of a, a shrug at the end of the day, which... Yeah, and, might, and I, I agree with what yeah, you wrote. Yeah, and, and my only point with that was that if folks need high-dose EPA, DHA, say like they're metabolically deranged and we're trying to turn the boat around, they might be better off with just standard fish oil initially. And then when they're at their maintenance dose, the cod liver oil is probably a, a just fine option. What I like about the cod liver oil is that it contains more DHA than EPA typically. And mm. DHA is the, the precious stuff, as I mentioned. But, you know, one has to wonder how sustainable the whole fish oil, cod liver oil industry really is. You know, why not just eat fish and liver um, and if your diet is optimal then you, you shouldn't need that much supplementation anyways if any so in the end actually the only sustainable omega-3 supplement is algal DHA like growing algae and squeezing the DHA out of them uh, fixes CO2 from the atmosphere it is entirely sustainable um, and then you can take that DHA and retroconvert it to uh to EPA, so I, you know, if I had to pick what is the best source of omega three fatty acids, it's just algal algal DHA. Is it? Hey Matt, are are yeah. you still on there? Um, the folks oftentimes mention uh, fermented cod liver oil. What what's the what's the story with that? I have not looked into that, so I don't okay. know. Maybe. I'm just. It would be interesting to see what the for how the fermentation process um, affects the composition of the oil. Yeah, I, I, and mechanistically, it doesn't make much sense to me, but the, the well, what's in price The fermentation folks. requires sugars, so, yeah. and I know that the fermentation process will improve the digestibility of proteins, it'll improve the digestibility of carbohydrates, but I have not seen a whole lot of information on fat. Right. So I'm, okay. I'm not sure what's going on there. Cool. All right, very excited about the next question. <laughs> Number three, post-workout carbohydrate. I know you wrote a stellar piece some time ago on low-carb and CrossFit. How has your viewpoint evolved from that experiment and over time? So um, I, I, I try to behave as best as possible as a uh, responsible scientist, and I will tell you right now that if 
this article on Rob's blog had been a published piece in the scientific literature, I would retract it because I do not want anyone to repeat that experiment. I, that was really foolish, naive, and stupid of me. Uh, don't do it. And, and I'll explain to you uh, what happened. Uh, I was I was about three to four months into the experiment. I was uh, eating just meat and uh, maybe some vegetables, some greens, and fat. You know, I was getting no to the very little carbohydrate and that whole deal. And I was following main site programming. Uh, and uh, I, I was actually, you know, I was seeing my um, my results improve. And, and I'll talk a little bit later about why I think that is in, a, in another related question. Uh, but after I wrote that up. I completely crashed. Uh, there's this one workout that addressed, actually I switched to the, the OPT website at that point, and uh, that bastard wrote a workout that just destroyed me. I have short arms, and I'm not that tall, so rowing is not my strength. And he put a workout together that was rowing and sumo deadlift high pulls. And uh, I'm just rolling on the floor at the end of this workout, and my eyes are sinking into my skull, and I'm I'm just going in and out of of consciousness, you know, I, I just I could barely, um, barely focus on anything, and uh, I it just started. I, I could at least still think, and I'm like, wow, my brain's running out of glucose, like dangerously. The, you know, I just did something really bad. So I, I managed to compose myself and pick myself off the ground, and uh, I work out at Hemingway on the Harvard campus, and it's pretty close to Harvard Square. And in the Harvard Square, there's the garage. In the garage, there's a Ben and Jerry's, and I just sat <laughs> at the counter at Ben and Jerry's, and I looked at the menu to make sure, and I picked three kinds of ice cream that had no uh, gluten in them because they have things like cookie dough and whatnot. And I just looked at the girl and I said, "Give me three pints." <laughs> and and she uh, she obliged, and I ate all of it. I, and I was still like in my shorts and t-shirt. I ate all of it right there at the counter in front of her uh, within the matter of minutes. And uh, and I could and I could feel my body soaking it up, uh, soaking up the sugar as I was doing that, uh, and and felt much better afterwards. Even though I don't tolerate fructose really well, um, so you know, don't do that. If you are going to burn carbohydrate, uh, eat some carbohydrate. I would just prefer that that carbohydrate comes from starchy sources and uh, and lower in fructose, so roots, tubers, and bulbs. Uh, I mean, it, it, I, there are some fruits that are low in fructose. You can go ahead and eat some of that. I just like the starchier stuff, like yucca root, for example. You can eat peeled potatoes if you want. But the problem here is that uh, if you um, – gluconeogenesis gets turned on by, by cortisol and other hormones, uh, and it's not that fast. It, it's not a very fast process. So in order for gluconeogenesis to, to ramp up, cortisol has to ramp up. But, you know, cortisol is that stress hormone, and your body doesn't know if cortisol is high because of stress or because of lack of sugar or whatnot. And so uh, my cortisol levels went so high that my free testosterone then plummeted. And there's this thing called the free testosterone to cortisol ratio. It's actually a biomarker of overtraining. If you want a reference on that, you can look up uh, a paper – influence of dietary carbohydrate intake on the free testosterone cortisol ratio responses to short-term intensive exercise training. That was published in the European Journal of Applied Physiology, and uh, the DOI is... I'm not going to read that. I'm just going to that. Anyways. <laughs> um, so, and then I got the... I got blood work done, and it, and it confirmed, in fact, that my testosterone was pretty low and my cortisol was really high. So this is... It's not a good idea. If you are going to do high-intensity exercise you should eat the carbohydrate that goes along with it. Um, so don't don't repeat that experiment. Uh, Matt, do you want to share a little bit about what your eating looks like right now? Uh, yeah, I think there's a there's a question about that Where in we, here. Uh, all right. Well, then we'll save it. Teaser. Okay. okay. <clears throat> uh, number four, I'm just going to read the first part because we're not going to read all these comments. It'll take yep. my whole life. Uh, Debbie says, Matt, I've been uh, really been working at being a paleo health person. My only problem is I have Hashimoto disease. I work out five days a week. I watch what I eat, perhaps more of a 85% paleo. What can I do to speed things along? I've been doing paleo since May 2010, lost about 15 pounds very, very slowly. Lots of tweaking with my thyroid meds, and I continually tweak my food. Can you give me any suggestions? Thanks in advance, Debbie. Yeah, so if you look at the comments, the, there's some people that made some uh, 
good recommendations here. And I know that Rob has a section on his site about the uh, like the autoimmune protocol. I unfortunately didn't get the chance to uh, to read that. I'm sure my there's going to be some overlap with the recommendations I give here. Uh, but gluten free or 100% paleo is not enough. And she's not even 100% paleo. She's like 85% paleo. If you have a, an autoimmune disease, you need a pretty rough buy in here. Um, so here, here's the recommendations I'm going to make. Uh, I think you, you should follow a lowish carbohydrate diet. Keep in mind that might increase TSH levels, but that doesn't, uh, that's not, doesn't mean it's pathological. Uh, I want the carbohydrate that you consume to be mostly glucose uh, and a little bit less fructose. So, you know, go for vegetables, roots, tubers, and bulbs, but limit fruits. Um, peel your vegetables whenever possible, just because uh, a lot of the protective chemicals are found in the peel. Um, and then the following foods or substances have to be eliminated from your diet or life. Cereal grains, including, and I'm going to be comprehensive here, <laughs> oh, oh, Lord. of wheat, whether it's spelt, einkorn, emmer, or durum, barley, rye, oats, triticale, corn, maize, rice, including wild rice, sorghum, mie, banyo, and teff, they have to be gone. All grain-like substances are pseudo-cereals, whether it's amaranth, breadnut, buckwheat, cattail, chia, coxcomb, kaniwa, pit seed, goosefoot, quinoa, and wattle seed, which is also known as acacia seed, has to be gone. Eggs of any kind, dairy of any kind, nuts and seeds of any kind, nightshades, which includes tomatoes, potatoes, eggplants, and peppers, especially hot peppers that contain capsaicin, they're gone. Alcohol, gone. NSAIDs of any kinds, including aspirin, none. Antacids that contain aluminum hydroxide, none. Those that contain calcium carbonate are fine. Oral contraceptives you might want to consider eliminating. And then if you have Hashimoto's, you should avoid supplementing with iodine because it's going to upregulate thyroid function and make things worse. Uh, there, um, there are some people that I've worked with that have like all kinds of funky autoimmune things going on. And uh, I had this one person that just reacted to any kind of plant matter. It, it, I thought it was insane, but uh, uh, I eventually recommended an all meat and fat diet for her. And I just made sure that she got some, she didn't have Hashimoto, so I made sure that she got some, some iodine in there uh, and that she was getting quality meat from grass-fed animals. So she got plenty of CLA, carotenoids, conjugated uh, linoleic acid, vaccinic acid, and, and omega-3s and all that stuff. And she actually did fine. Like for the first time, uh, her liver enzymes came back positive and uh, she's improving. Uh, but then, you know, if she breaks down and has a sweet potato or a pear, like she wakes up the next morning, she's completely swollen. So uh, I, I know it's a rough buy-in, but uh, this is it. Hmm. it that, that's more, a little bit more comprehensive than what I've typically recommended uh, trying to think j just a, a longer list of like the grain and grain light substances but I usually just throw a big big net over that and then the other things that I usually uh, recommend is some sort of a, a dairy free probiotic and then making sure that vitamin D levels are are that you know 60 to 80 nanograms per deciliter because of the, uh, the immune modulating action on that yeah those but are good recommendations too vitamin D probiotics I'm not sure if you need prebiotics if you're eating a lot of vegetables, but if you're not, prebiotics might be useful. Cool. All right. Uh, ben says, short and sweet, what type of eating would be recommended for a lean 31-year-old strict paleo for 1.5 years, 164 at 5 foot 11, looking to get body weight up to 180 to 190 on rip starting strength, only 1.5 months in, slowly gaining weight and progressing on rip's linear path while maintaining strict paleo. I only ask if Alon thinks there's another way of eating that'd be more beneficial given my goals. If not, cool, I'll keep up the strict paleo. It is, after all, very tasty and effective. I just want to know if he thinks this is the best path. Thanks, Dees. Update your blog, dude. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to make these recommendations assuming that you are not an idiot like I was and that you're not doing any metabolic conditioning or high-intensity exercise. The diet I'm going to prescribe is, is not good for that, but it will be great for putting on muscle mass uh, on a, a heavy lifting schedule. So uh, I would uh, I would eat a diet that is ketogenic, where you're sticking mostly to meat and low GI vegetables. Organ meats like liver and heart are going to give you a huge bang for your buck, and then a lot of animal fat, uh, hopefully from good sources. Uh, one of my favorite things to do when I was running that experiment was using liver pate and foie gras and, and mousses and all kind of that stuff. Be careful with the mousses. They sometimes throw 
uh, gluten in there. So just read the ingredients uh, carefully. And then other good sources of fats like avocados, olives, coconut, palm oil, and all that stuff, you know, you can throw that in. Maybe some high fat, you know, fermented dairy. I would not recommend the gallon of milk a day. Please do not do that. It's just, it's not good. And I'm not going to take the time to discuss all of the the uh, the effects, uh, detrimental health effects that are involved with that, but just don't do that. Um, so, and get plenty of sleep. You know, I, I, when I ran that experiment, I put on 50, at least 15 pounds of muscle mass. I actually leaned out and went from 165 to 180. So uh, it, it works pretty well, but you know, there's, there's not a whole lot of glucose that's going to be uh, provided by that diet. So just don't be a moron and, and metcon yourself do the Metcon suicide that I did. And, and so that that's where in, it, it's so hard in the population of folks that we kind of kind of cater to. Folks are completely unwilling to really focus on one area. So what, what Matt's saying here is no Metcon. <laughs> like lift heavy weights, walk, and sleep. And uh, then you, you should get some pretty good bang for your buck out of that, uh, that approach to eating. This is also where I, I went seriously awry with all this stuff where I would uh, Olympic lifted, did gymnastics, ate a, a ketogenic diet and felt great on that, had good performance, then started getting into CrossFit and could never really uh, get the sweet spot on my uh, the amount of carbs that I had to eat to maintain that. And I, I started gaining body fat because of the uh, the cortisol induced from the training. Yep. So I, I, I was less less lean regardless of what calorie intake level or or carbohydrate intake level i i was at so yeah i'm, I'm doing a lot more traveling right now and i can tell the uh there's a little bit of chub out around the midline that's reappearing so cortisol is huge here um you guys are wrong you know you need to metcon to be lean come on people <laughs> <laughs> works great for chicks <laughs> Uh, David says, uh, Matt mentioned in an interview he only eats two meals a day. I'm interested in how he gets enough calories to support his performance efforts. What does he eat and what does it consist of, both workout days and rest days? Also, if this is an individual thing or if it's something he recommends for everyone. Uh, I will, you know, as a scientist, I will never say using an experiment of N equals one that you should do this because it worked for me because it's completely illogical. Uh, Rob was also worried at some point that I might not be getting enough calories, but I uh, I documented an entire day's worth of food, <laughs> and, and I still keep sending him my meals from time to time. And he's like, "Oh, okay, you're yeah, you're eating a lot." It it's, is it is epic meal time, Lalonde style. Yeah, so my lunch is is enormous, but um, so you know. That being said, I don't recommend this to everyone. If you are highly stressed or if you're metabolically deranged, like you have type two diabetes. Don't mess with intermittent fasting. Not good for you. Uh, this approach works for me, but I'm not going to recommend it, you know, to everyone just because it works for me. So, but here it goes. Here's what I do. Um, I skip breakfast on weekdays because it allows me to sleep in, and I'm not really hungry in the morning. I'll typically eat lunch at noon. Uh, lunch is comprised of a hefty portion of meat, and by hefty, I mean one pound to one and a half pounds of meat uh, and I get all of my meat from wow. a local farm called Chestnut Farms and they have a CSA and they're really really awesome and I will have all of the rendered fat with that meat that they came with that meat I do not throw any fat away I'll place all of that on top of a mound of like green leafy vegetables uh, typically like a 50-50 mix of a spinach and then spring mix and then I'll top that off with a portion of starchy vegetables or tubers I, I like to uh, slow roasted parsnips i like me some yucca root some sweet potatoes those those are my favorites um and then uh, i'll uh, i'll heat everything in the microwave together such that the facts fat mixes with the greens and that allows you to absorb more fat soluble vitamins uh, from the greens uh, and then uh if i eat like a a, a dish of meat that was pre prepared on the side then i'll just grab the greens put the the tubers on top put some butter and some himalayan salt and i'll heat everything separately and and i'll eat that so that, that's typically lunch and and sometimes i'll have like an entire you know bottle of like the the fermented uh, what they call it the cultured coconut milk which is really awesome it has both prebiotics and probiotics in it and that's really great and you get that from so delicious and whole foods sells it uh, and i'll typically and I, i'll sometimes have vegetables on the side to, to boot and some celery or a seaweed salad or something like that uh, it, it's it's big. Like lunch takes me over an hour to eat. It's a lot of food. <laughs> um, I'll train between five and seven p.m. 
and then I'll eat my last meal at around 8 p.m. So that means that I fast for 16 hours until noon the next day. And then I will occasionally have a low-protein dinner just to make sure that autophagy kicks in. Um, I often go back home to Ottawa, and whenever I do, I, you know, I get some coaching from Pierre Auger, uh, who's really awesome. I can't say enough good things about the guy. You know, Pierre is, is he's a scientist at heart. He just keeps tinkering with stuff and looking for new things to try out, and, and always seeking to improve his game. Uh, he was telling me about. Uh, he asked me a question. He's like, you know, there's these Bulgarian lifters that would eat meat ad libitum during the week, but then on the weekends they would eat just greens and fat and no meat. And I was wondering if that was like intermittent fasting, or blah, blah, blah. And I didn't have an answer for him at the time, but after doing more research, I found out that one of the benefits of intermittent fasting is turning on of autophagy, which is essentially the, the cell cleaning house and you know recycling a bunch of junk and, uh, and turning it back into amino acids and, and its basic components. Um, and autophagy is turned on uh, actually is turned off when you eat a lot of protein, specifically branch chain amino acids. So protein starvation can turn on autophagy. So if you don't eat a whole lot of protein for a period of time, then you're going to turn on this process, which means that you can fast without fasting or get one of the beneficial aspects of fasting without fasting, which is really interesting. So you can keep eating some food but still get uh, the, the beneficial aspect effects of fasting. You're, you're not going to get used to dipping into your energy stores if you still eat something, but you, you're still going to get autophagy going on, uh, which is kind of cool. Um, maybe I should mention not long ago, I tried exercising in a fasted state, and, and that broke me. It, it really did. Um, I was not expecting that. Uh, I was expecting something positive to come out of it, but uh, I, I did it for only one week, and it, it, it kicked my ass. So I was following the same protocol, but instead of eating at noon, I worked out between noon and one, and then I had my largest meal immediately after that. And then, but what I found is that I, I started under eating because I wasn't all that hungry immediately after a workout. And then even in the evening, I wasn't all that hungry. And what happened is that by the end of one week of doing this, I, I woke up shivering one evening and and wanting to throw up and I just and I couldn't sleep well and my sleep just went to crap um, and and my libido went way down like everything just started heading south and I'm like whoa this this has to stop this is not bad I gave Rob a call like does this sound like hypercortisolism to you what's going on and he's like yeah just back away from from the from the fasted training I think I'm very strict with my diet I very rarely cheat because it hurts me really bad fructose hurts me really really bad. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I fast regularly during the week. So I think that, you know, what, what I was doing was fine and, and I didn't need to throw this in, but I was stupid. I threw it in you know, five times a, a week. Maybe I should have tried like one time a week and see what the heck would have happened. Um, also should mention that on the weekends I overeat just to make sure that uh, my body is not feeling like it's starved and, and turning on various mechanisms and, and lowering uh, metabolism. So my breakfast on the weekends, that's Saturday and Sunday, is going to be either one pound of sausage or one pound of bacon with four duck eggs and then some a little bit of berries on the side. I'll do that both days, and I will actually not eat lunch because I'm not hungry, but I will eat dinner on those days. So I'm eating a lot of food on those days. And Matt, give folks some, uh, what are your max lifts right now? Like you're doing pretty good on the, the power lifts. Yeah, yeah, I'd like to focus on that because I really suck on the Olympic uh, lifts. Um, my deadlift conventional is 500. My sumo is 455. I'm, I got some coaching by Pierre Auger that, uh, and he works with Ily, Willie Albert, actually, which is a, a record holder in the sumo deadlift uh, in his weight class. Uh, Pierre and Willie give a good uh, um, seminar on a uh, weekend long seminar on, on powerlifting and Olympic weightlifting, by the way. So you should check that out. You know, those are two totally legit dudes. Anyways, it, I'm, I'm trying to get that sumo deadlift to catch up to my conventional deadlift. So conventional 500, uh, sumo 455. Uh, Pierre took my sumo from 425 to 455. So that was good. Uh, overhead press is 200. Bench press is 355. Uh, back squat is 425. Uh, front squat is 335. And now weigh 180 pounds. 180. And then you're still doing a little bit of Metcon too. Like if we ever wanted to peak you for a uh, an event, we'd probably peel that out. And we'd probably, I, I suspect, probably see a 
an easy 10% bump on top of all of that stuff. Yeah, so, possibly. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Matt. It's time for your three questions because I got to go train people. All right. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> Rob Wolf. Be gentle. Question number one. This compound is found in green tea, and it's abbreviated as EGCG. Can you pronounce it properly? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Epigallocatechin gallate. Wrong. Epigallocatechin gallate. Adichin gallate, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Dude, don't, don't talk to me about pronunciation, my French-Canadian pal. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> Okay. I kept, I kept on wanting to leap in and uh, uh, restate autophagy, but uh, uh, however you were saying it was pretty good. So Not potato, potato. Okay, lay, lay it into me. That, uh, All right. Number two, this substance is secreted by fat cells. The word begins with the letters A-D, and it ends with nectin. Oh, Jesus. Adiponectin. No, it's wrong. <laughs> Adiponectin. A diponectin. <laughs> All right, number three. <laughs> this uh, this condition uh, renders the individuals who suffer from it sensitive to sunshine. Uh, one of your clients had this condition, and you uh, uh, constantly talk about it in your seminars about how she recovered by avoiding uh, gluten. Uh, what is the name of the condition? Porphyria cutanea. Parda. Damn, you got it right. Yeah. Yay, I just, we got I just, one. I just have to pay attention. I get all <laughs> spun up and excited. So, Rob, we're gonna have to come up with your punishment after the show. What? One out of three. Not not too bad. <laughs> so, Matt, are you gonna come back and continue to answer the never ending never ending list of Matt Milan?